Furthermore, the equation E is equal mc squared. Hello and welcome to another Cheeky Scientist radio podcast. I am Isaiah Hankel with Cheeky Scientist. We have a great show for you today. This is the radio show for PhDs who want to get hired into their first or next job in industry and who want to thrive in business. Thank you for joining us. Here we go. We are live and good to go. So welcome to another Cheeky Scientist radio show. I am your host, Isaiah Henkel with Cheeky Scientist. We have a great show lined up for you today. We have a lot of segments that we will be covering. Today's show is focused on transferable skills, specifically leadership skills, the skills you have as a PhD and you're likely not communicating on your resume, on your LinkedIn profile, or during your job search in general. We are going to be focusing on these topics today. We have a very special guest today, Peter Bregman, who is a best-selling author. He is giving away a substantial portion of his book today for free as the show-up bonus, which I will show you very shortly. Um, we, of course, will have our show me the data section. We have a lot of great data to cover specifically on leadership, specifically on the transferable skills you have, some key words that you're probably not using on your resume or your LinkedIn profile that you will definitely want to pay attention to. Uh, so we'll be going to the show me the data section first, then we'll bring on Peter. And then we're going to talk about immigration, a very hot topic. But of course, we're talking about skilled immigration and getting your visa. We're going to go through all the different visa types for those of you who want to work in the U.S. Why are we covering this? Because almost 50% of the PhDs in the U.S. right now were born outside of the U.S., uh, which is pretty amazing. If you think about it, I think the, the recent data shows that by 2020, 50% or more of the PhDs in the U.S. will be born outside the U.S. So this means that a lot of you, most of you, half, almost half, uh, will have to navigate the visa process in some way. We have, we have partnered with an immigration firm, which is the number one firm in the world when it comes to helping STEM PhDs get visas and get green cards. In fact, that's all they do. That is their specialty. Uh, their entire firm is dedicated to this. Uh, Brian Getson, who is a partner at the, at the firm, will be on with us to discuss this. And then during our special members only portion of the radio show, where only associates, if you're in our association, you get uh, access to this portion. Uh, we will be going through a lot of, of great things. We have a, a special call in uh, where we'll be talking about some resume issues that you'll need to pay attention to for 2019. And we will be talking about LinkedIn and go through a couple of LinkedIn profile reviews where you can ask your questions. And we are going to go through some live profiles. And then we're going to do a special if we have time, stump Isaiah section, where one of our team members will come on and ask a tough interview question. And I will do my best to use the STAR method and the cheeky methodology in general to answer that question. So great to see all of you on. Yeah. How are you? Good to see you. Are you ready Good. for the show me the data section? I am ready. All right. So I'm going to share my screen here. Now, Jeanette has done a great job going through the current data that's online right now, pulling out things that are relevant for this radio show topic. And we have some great charts to show you today. So please tell Jeanette, thank you um, in the chat box while I pull this up. I'm gonna share my screen. You should be able to see three charts here. And what I'm gonna do is the same thing I always do for all of our uh, show me the data sections. I'm gonna walk you through it first. For those of you listening by audio, describe what the charts are showing. And then Jeanette's gonna give us some takeaways and some conclusions. So the first set of charts here, this is from a PNAS article. Um, titled Changing Demographics of Scientific Careers, The Rise of the Temporary Workforce. What does this mean? We're going to talk about it. So the first three charts have a, on the, on the y-axis, they have the percentage remaining in the field, and it's percentage remaining in the field of astronomy, ecology, and robotics. So it's supposed to be a, uh, some random STEM fields. And I guess there was some meth methodology to the STEM fields they chose that we'll talk to, to Jeanette about in a second. Now, there's three of these graphs. On the, uh, the, the x-axis is years since entering the field. And then we have a bunch of colored lines that seem to get shorter and shorter 
as the time gets more current. So the colored lines are labeled 2010, 2006, 2001, 1996, 1991, 1986, 1981. And what we're looking at here is how quickly people are leaving academia in these fields. So Jeanette, what are the trends that we see here? Yeah, so great. I'll start with explaining the choice, right? So they picked these three different fields, astronomy, ecology, robotics. Um, in the paper, they say that they chose these because they sort of represent each different areas of STEM, where astronomy is physical science, ecology is life science, and robotics is like engineering slash technology. Yes. Um, so that's why they, they picked them. Um, and then what I like to look at in this picture is actually to look at the slopes of the lines. Um, so that's kind of what you're looking at. You can see that they start, the slope is not as severe um, in like 1980s, right? Mm. So that means that the percentage of people remaining in the field um, is slow to change, right? So after 30 years, so let's look at astronomy, for example. It makes more sense if I talk about a specific example. So yes. if we look at the 1981 line, which is the red one, you can see that the percentage of people remaining in the field is between 30 and 40% after 30 years. Yes. Right? And so you're seeing this like slowly sloping line. 30 years. Yeah, after 30 the years, line. there was still that many people so left. And generation. this is in academia. Yeah, yes. in academia. And then if we look shift over looking at 2010, you can see that that line, the slope has become much greater. It's like almost straight up and down um, in astronomy. And um, clearly it hasn't been 30 years since 2010 yet so that's why the line is shorter nice. um but you can see that even after five years um there's only 70 percent of people left in the field so it's just showing this change in how quickly people are leaving each of these fields leaving their academic positions in these fields right so the key is to look at the slope right and so yeah. the steeper the slope the faster people are leaving the field so every segment by year right? People are leaving faster, academia faster and faster. Yeah. So if we were to like extend that 2010 line, if you were to like imagine in your brain, like let's draw the line all the way down to the bottom, right. you're going to see that after 10 years, it's going to be that like there's 30% people remaining instead of 30 years. Right. Yeah. And which is pretty phenomenal. I mean, and this is why when we, we always talk about full-time professorships going extinct. Like if you saw, if this was a, a chart of a species, what would you say <laughs> is happening to that species, species? Can I say the word? I, apparently not. What would, what would you say is happening, right? If this was like the chart of the dodo bird, would you be like, oh yeah, this bird's going to make it? No, you're like, this bird is, is dying out. It's almost dead. I mean, the slope literally for some of these is almost straight down. And this is 2010. I would love to see the 2018 data, right? Um, it's pretty phenomenal. And so, why is this so important? Because if you're still in academia holding on to this uh, idea that things are not changing drastically and that people aren't leaving academia right after getting their PhD now, um, you're, you're holding on to data that doesn't exist. The data is showing you that um, they're leaving almost immediately. And so, you know, with, in terms of the cohorts that were chosen, we talked about this before the show started, right? So astronomy, ecology, robotics, I mean, these seem like is there any method to the, the, the cohorts that they chose? Well, like I said, they just picked uh, examples within, that's what they said in the paper, examples within each of these like disciplines of STEM. But I mean, you, you see, it could be different. It would be interesting to see a larger population, right? Where they just took right. everyone all together. Like, yeah, I agree. It would be interesting to see that data too. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, so the point was to take a sampling of STEM, right? So they have astronomy, robotics, which would be more tech or engineering and then ecology more, I guess, life sciences. Um, but it'd be great to see, yeah, the larger grouping. Like I like to see life sciences, physical sciences, engineering, mm -hmm. or maybe just more of your bread and butter, like biology. But that could be my own slanted view too, just because I'm not uh, an astronomist. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Although I like astronomy. So then, then they did this, this uh, again, something that's very cool for, for us uh, STEM PhDs, right? They look at the half-life of these cohorts. So maybe you can take us through this chart. And, and for those of us that are listening by audio only, um, on the y-axis, we have the half-life in years. And in the x-axis, we have the cohort year. And we're looking at three different colored lines, astronomy, ecology, robotics. All of those lines are higher up on the y-axis on the left and then they go pretty sharply downward um, towards the right. So can you walk us through what this is actually showing? 
much, no? Yeah. Yeah. So this figure, when they look at the half-life, I feel like this sort of simplifies the data that we just looked at. So they're looking at this half-life and how they define it is the amount of time it takes for 50% of a specific cohort to have left academia. So hmm. how much time is it taking for half of the people to leave? And you can see that um, on the x-axis, we've got that over time, hmm. right? So in 1960, it took about 35 years for half of the people to leave after academia. That's a whole career, wow. right? So basically half of the people were staying in academia for their entire career. Yes. Right. And then if we look all the way at the other end at the 2010 data, you can see that the half-life has dropped to about five years. So that means half of the people are leaving after just five years in academia. Right. And this, yeah. this is post PhD. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's after yeah. as a professional. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so those numbers are, are, are pretty amazing. I mean, we can't even imagine that half of the people after they get their PhD would stay in academia for 35 years, but it used to be like that. There used to be a high level of security now. And why is this so important? Because a lot of PhDs that we talk to who first come into our association are like, well, I'm worried about industry because of the uncertainty or the lack of security. And we're like, what are you talking about? Like, look at the data now, the most insecure place to be in I think out of all careers for PhDs is in academia. I mean, look at the half-life, look at the data. The data doesn't lie here. And that's why we're showing it to you. So next we shift gears a little bit to talking about some of these key transferable skills also referred to very often as leadership competencies or core competencies of an individual. Uh, this is from a Harvard Business Review article titled the most important leadership competence competencies according to leaders around the world. Um, and then it shows the top 10 leadership competencies grouped into five themes. So 195 global leaders were asked to rate 75 qualities. And th these are the ones that rose to the top. So we have the five groups that they made, whether it was arbitrary or not, was strong ethics and safety, self-organizing, efficient learning, nurtures growth, connection and belonging. And then we have from top to bottom with various percentages. We have 67% at the top is the highest in terms of a leadership competency is high ethical and moral standards all the way down to 37% provide safety for trial and error. So I'll stop there, Jeanette, and let you kind of jump in and, and walk us through this a bit more. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So you just pretty much went through it very well there, I think actually is so showing that these are the traits that this uh, survey found that leaders value, right? These are the things that they think are really important qualities in a good leader. Um, and I think it's really interesting to note that the strong ethics and safety is the top, right? So it's important that you, I know we talked about this a bit earlier, but that it's important that your ethics and your morals are, are good and solid because I feel like that's the only way someone is going to get behind you. So I think we often forget about this and think that as a leader, you just need to be confident and know what you're doing. You need to be very, like, t very savvy and, and have all of those skills. But that's actually not even on this list, right? Being skilled is not on this list. <laughs> and mm -hmm. so, but being very um, organized and nurturing growth and being very, um, having strong ethics is on this list. Yeah. And to take, the, take a, a slightly, a little bit of a counterpoint, but really saying the same thing in a different way. I think what we were talking about before the show is like, look, if you put on a survey that ethics and moral standards is one of the top choices, like is, is a choice, everybody's going to choose that. Most people are going to choose that because you don't want to be seen as unethical. Like if you don't choose ethics being important to you, you're going to be seen as unethical. And there's other studies out there that show like this is a psychological thing, right? So we self-justify by choosing stuff. And that's why, you know, people get on their high horse or whatever. So there might be a factor there. What does that mean? It just means that that might be why we see like a big grouping of people in like the 40 and 50%. And then we see this huge outlier of ethics and moral standards. But whose ethics? Whose moral standards? Mm -hmm. It's a good question to know. And I would say on the results front, this isn't focused on technical skills here, which is very important. And that's what I, I think Jeanette was, was getting to. Um, but results clearly matter. That's why number two on the list is provides goals and objections, uh, uh, objectives. Now, a lot of you have come to us and say one of the things that you struggle with the most in academia is you have no clear goals and objectives when it comes to your career, right? You know the data you want to get, but you don't know what you have to do to actually 
get into a professorship, to make it to that next step. And a lot of you have been given like a goal or an objective and, or a target, and it's been a moving target, right? You get that paper and you're like, well, no, if you just get this one other paper, or if you just work for free a little bit longer, or if you just do this, you know, get help us get this grant, then you can move to that next step and it never comes. We have one more chart here, and then we're going to bring on our special guest, uh, Peter Bregman, uh, Decoding Leadership, What Really Matters. And this is by Claudio Fesser. It's a McKinsey and Company uh, study. And it's, uh, the, the chart we're looking at here is four kinds of behavior account for 89% of leadership effectiveness. Bold claim. There is some data to back it up, though. So what are the four kinds of behavior that account for 89% of leadership effectiveness? The four that we're looking at here, and then we'll turn to Jeanette for analysis. Be supportive. That's highlighted as number one and marked as number one. Uh, highlighted also is operate with strong with a strong results orientation. We just talked about that a little bit. 19, seek different perspectives. And 20, solve problems effectively. So can you walk us through this? What, what do the different numbers mean and why do they choose those four? Um, yeah, the numbers are just to like list the, they don't mean anything actually. They're just like listing the number of the options. But the, um, what they looked at in this study was they compared successful companies and not so successful companies. So they looked at what are the traits that are appearing in leaders in the companies that are doing well, like they're in the top, you know, co uh, quadrant of their successfulness versus those in the bottom. And they found that these four traits were associated with what they were calling effective leadership, not just leadership like that. Oh, you look good like a leader, but leadership that was actually getting things done and making the company successful were these four traits. Perfect. So again, and, and I think this goes back to data we looked at last week and we'll talk a bit, a bit more about this is there's these two sides, right? To having, to fitting into a company's culture, to being a good leader, um, to managing your own transferable skills and, and what a company's looking for. On the one hand, performance, results. You have to get results. You have to perform. Uh, you have to be able to solve problems effectively. But at the same time, you got to be able to work as a team, be able to see different perspectives. You have to care. And those were kind of the two things in the balance we saw last week with the data, right? So results, performance and then caring and, and managing those two things. So if you can communicate both of those effectively and, and show that kind of balance, you're going to make yourself a, a much more qualified job candidate in the employer's eyes. So please do me a favor and thank Jeanette for her analysis. We're going to turn to our first guest here. That is the end of the show me the data section. Thank you, Jeanette. Great to see you as always. Okay. So our next guest is the best selling author of the book, Leading with Emotional Courage. And I'm going to show you our show up bonus one more time. You can get over 20 pages of Peter's book for free, Leading with Emotional Courage, by going to CheekyScientist.com. Show up bonus emotional courage. There's a dash in between every one of the words after the slash. Um, but again, CheekyScientist.com, show up bonus emotional courage. While I'm sharing my screen, I'm going to go through Peter's bio, bio here. Very, very impressive. For over 30 years, Peter has worked with CEOs and senior leaders to help them create accountability and inspire collective action on their most important work. He helps leaders develop their leadership skills, um, build alignment, collabor uh, build a collaborative teams, and overcome obstacles to drive, res drive results for their organizations. Um, we're going to send you to a few of different uh, websites that Peter has. He also has a, I'm going to tease this now, we'll talk a bit, a bit more about it later, where is your leadership gap? This is a great assessment that all of you can take. So you can find out where you are in terms of these four core pillars of leadership, which we're going to talk to Peter about as well. Um, Peter has a, a podcast. He is the host of the Bregman Leadership Podcast, B-R-E-G-M-A-N Leadership Podcast, which offers insightful conversations with industry thought leaders on how to become more powerful and courageous leaders. He is a regular contributor to Harvard Business Review, Bloomberg Business Week, Fast Company, Psychology Today, Forbes, The Financial Times, PBS, ABC, CNN, NPR, and Fox Business News. Um, he is the author, again, of the book, Leading with Emotional Courage, How to Have Hard Conversations, Create Accountability, and Inspire Action on Your Most Important Work. He has other books as well, 18 Minutes, Find Your Focus, Master Distraction, and Get the Right Things Done, uh, which was a Wall Street Journal bestseller and winner of the gold medal from the Axiom Business Book Awards. 
Uh, it was also named the best business book of the year by NPR and selected by Publishers Weekly and the New York Post as a top 10 business book. 18 minutes. Find your focus, master distraction, and get the right things. I highly recommend getting that book and getting uh, get the book Leading with Emotional Courage uh, today. Great gift. Uh, great gifts that you can give out too. Um, I'll mention one other. He also is the author, author of Four Seconds. You seem to be reducing the amount of time uh, in each of the titles of these books, Peter. Uh, all the time you need to replace counterproductive habits with ones that really work. Uh, a New York Post top pick for your career, it was named uh, in 2015. And then finally, Point B, A Short Guide to Leading a Big Change. Um, lots of different books that you can check out. His LinkedIn profile, because all of us are on LinkedIn, right? Many of you are looking for jobs. This is his LinkedIn profile. And what I love here is the picture, right? You get to choose the picture you can put in your, in your, uh, your background picture. And there can be text there. And you can see how powerful this is. You can leverage this um, for yourself to showcase some of your key skills in your job search. Without further ado, I'm going to bring on Peter. Hi, Peter. How are you? I am well, thanks. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for joining us. I really appreciate your time. It's a pleasure. I love what you're doing. What I see of what you're doing, I love. I think it's great. Thanks. Yeah, so we, we have a, a large audience right now streaming of, of PhDs, many of whom are either in industry and they're trying to climb the corporate ladder to become leaders. We try to support them to get into, mm -hmm. you know, to be leaders of organizations, not just stay in these entry-level jobs or stay in the lab, um, but to develop these transferable skills and many of them looking for their first job. And, you know, the first question I think would be smart for us to answer is what exactly is emotional courage? So emotional courage is, and, and in the book, I talk about these four elements of leadership, which is, and, and I was actually just looking at what you were talking about beforehand in terms of the four um, uh, underlying skills that uh, make leaders most effective. And, and I, I don't disagree with those, actually. I think that, you know, kind of getting business results and supporting people and all that stuff is really important. And, and what I talk about is what underlies the ability mm -hmm. to do that, right? And mm -hmm. it's these four elements of being confident in yourself, connected to others, committed to purpose and emotional courage. And we could talk more about them, but they, they underlie it, meaning if you, if you aren't those four things, you're gonna have a hard time driving business results. You're gonna have a very, very hard time supporting yes. other people, et cetera. Emotional courage is the willingness to feel things. Mm. And this is actually particularly important, I think, with a PhD audience where you, know, you have honed your ability and your mind to think through things in very discerning ways, right? Very rational and discerning ways. And that's the, you know, I don't have a PhD, I have a master's, but that's the academic process, right? The yes. academic process is very much, logic. you know, logic and thinking through things. And, and now I'm going to challenge you to, to do a little activity, right? Which is to think about a hard conversation that you're not having. Right, mm. a hard conversation that you know you should have, and this is for everybody listening. That you know you should have. You know it's important. It doesn't have to be work. It could be personal. It could be anything you want, but you know you should have this conversation. But you've procrastinated on it. You haven't had it. And now consider why you haven't had it. And I'm willing to bet you know everything you need to know in order to have it. You have plenty of skills in order to have that conversation, and you've had time and opportunity. Mm. So if that's true, then why don't you follow through on something like that? And it's because there's something you don't want to feel that if you have this hard conversation, you may have to feel conflict. You may have to feel disconnection. You may have to feel their passive aggressiveness after the conversation. You might have to feel your anger or their anger. You might have to feel shame or embarrassment, or they might come back at you and you might get defensive. And because you don't want to feel any of these things, then you're better off not having the conversation and you hold it off. And if you're willing to feel everything, to, if you're willing to feel conflict and failure and shame and embarrassment and defensiveness and passive aggressive, if you're willing to feel everything, mm. then you can do anything. And if you think about, you know, this is true for any risk that you take and any, you know, any, you know, you're giving a lecture and it's risky and you're going to be approaching it in a certain way. Or you're working in an organization and you have to kind of contradict someone. And certainly you need the skill to do it well and you need, but ultimately, you need to be willing to feel what you have to feel in order to take the risk to follow through on what's important to you. And you might feel the insecurity and the vulnerability of speaking up when nobody mm. else is speaking up and you see something that's important to raise. And those are emotional issues. Those are the sort of, do you have the emotional courage mm. to the, you know, the willingness to feel everything in order to do those hard things. And that is the key that unlocks every other element of leadership. 
That's great. And, and, and before we get to those other elements, I want to make it really practical here. So I'm not even going to pull the group. I already know what a lot of you feel when you try to say, start networking, right? A lot of us went to academia, PhD, use logic. We want to get ahead on our own. And then we realize, wow, we need other people to get a job referral, to climb the ladder. And so we don't want to look stupid. We don't want to feel embarrassed if we do something networking. We don't want to feel maybe shame or rejected. Uh, you know, those three are the ones we hear a lot. So, okay, I hate feeling because I'm a thinker. I'm a, you know, uh, I'm a STEM PhD. How can I tiptoe into that? How can I practice? How can I get more comfortable with those feelings? Right. So first is just acknowledge that that's what's going on. Like that's huge, right? To recognize there's some feelings that are getting in my way and I'm actually really used to thinking and I'm really used to, and actually it's really interesting because, you know, when, when I work with academics too, I'll often say something like, what are you feeling? And the answer will be, I think I'm feeling, yeah. right? <laughs> and, and it's, you know, it's because we're so used to leveraging our intellect. And, and so the first thing to do is to recognize and, and begin to notice what you're feeling, really begin to feel. It's actually really important. And, and, you know, there's in, in certain languages, you know, in, in, in English, you say, I am angry. And that almost becomes a non-starter because if you say I am angry or I am sad or I am vulnerable, then it means that this emotion that is really just one dimension of what's going on in your body has overtaken you. You have become that and you mm. cannot be released from it. And it's actually true in many ways in terms of the feeling we have. But when we step away, there's languages where you say I have anger, right? Yeah. Or I have sadness. And if you begin to think of it that way, to say, okay, I'm going into a networking event and I'm feeling insecure. Where do you feel that insecurity? Where, literally where in your body? It is a physical sensation. So where in your body do you feel it? And begin to locate it. And once you've done that, then mm. you realize, oh, this is it's just a sensation. Like this feeling of insecurity is a sensation. And my mind may run wild. Everyone's going to hate me and I'm going to say something stupid and then, then I'm going to lose all my job opportunities and then and step, 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 I'm homeless. And, and if you can kind of step away from that a little bit and go, oh, they have this sensation and it's kind of in my chest and mm. it, this is what it feels like. This is what it feels like to walk into a room of strangers and start to meet them, right? Mm. And by the way, if you can manage that, then maybe you don't go in the room and start talking all about how great you are because that's what you do when you're insecure about how other people will perceive you and it will, by definition, make everybody not like you. And instead, you'll walk in and you'll ask a question and you'll listen because mm -hmm. you're not overtaken by the emotion that drives you to do things that insecurity drives us to do, which is to try to make us feel more secure, which often backfires. So I think the first step is... Are you willing to feel and notice what you're feeling and notice where you're feeling it? My two favorite words are, what are you feeling? I have sentences or what are you feeling and where are you feeling it? And mm. notice that. And then don't wait for that feeling to go away. I was, I was trying to do some writing. I've written four books and, and I have confidence in my nonfiction writing, but I don't have confidence in my fiction writing. I actually am, don't think I'm a very good fiction writer at all. And I've been having a hard time writing fiction. And uh, the, I said this to a friend of mine and she said, well, what's, what's stopping you? You're like, you just sit down and you write, what's stopping you? And I said, and by the way, anyone who um, is working on your dissertation <laughs> will be able to uh, connect with this. And, and I said, you know, I think I'm scared. Like, I think mm. I'm scared. I'm not good. I think I'm scared. I don't know how to do this. I think, you know, I have a reputation. I've, you know, I'm a bestseller and now I'm going to like write terrible stuff and I'm scared. And she laughed and she said, oh, you think you're supposed to be able to write without feeling scared? And it was this great aha, like we wait for the emotion to go away until it feels great to do what we need to do. Mm. But the reality is you have to do that even when it doesn't feel good. So it, the idea is sit down and don't wait for the fear to go away. Write while you're feeling afraid. Mm. Write the dissertation while you're feeling afraid walk into that room when it doesn't feel right to walk in the room and recognize yeah. that you're going to feel that. And that's what it feels like to walk into a room with strangers and start to connect with people. And so allow yourself to do that while you're feeling the emotions that you're feeling. And it will be really powerful. There's a, a, a uh, um, friend of mine, Sylvia Borstein, who's a Buddhist uh, and a writer, and she writes 
great books. And in mm. one of her books, she talks about walking with her grandson up to this temple. And there are these big steps up in the temple and walking up to these big intimidating wooden doors. And, and her grandson was holding hands, but holding, holding back, like pulling her back. And she said, what, what's happening? And he said, I don't like the stairs. And her answer was, oh, sweetie, you don't have to like the stairs. You just have to climb them. Mm-hmm. And it was, it's such a great story of like, right while you're feeling scared, you know, walk into that room while you're feeling insecure and, and just keep moving. And that's what allows you to, to develop the emotional courage. Yeah, I really like that. I mean, network while you feel awkward. You, you don't, yeah. you're, you're not supposed to not feel anything while you're networking. And so I think, you know, there's two sides of this. And I want to ask another question that comes up quite a bit too on, on the topic of feelings for PhDs. So what you just answered is, you know, recognizing that feelings are important. But I think there's also resistance because very often PhDs see feelings as those things that people use to manipulate us, right? Like, we are supposed to be objective and cut to the heart and do A plus B and remove feelings so that we don't get distracted. I, Cause if I feel too strongly that I want a piece of data to say one thing, but it doesn't, it can influence my decision. So how, how do you handle that? So two things. One is, you know, I remember, um, I remember being in high school and watching a documentary about Hiroshima mm. and and, and then sort of analyzing it afterwards. And I really remember this. I mean, this is, we're going back 30 something years. Um, I know it looks like it's just been. A year. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and I remember feeling like, oh, wow, that, you know, was terrible. Mm. Uh, and, and I remember somebody else uh, who was more academically oriented at the time who said, oh, you know, this documentary is just playing on our emotions. Like if you really look at you know, the decision that we made actually probably prevented millions of deaths and, you know, because we stopped the war and you know, that's the intellectual way to look at it. And I remember thinking, and I, and I still think, you know, there's a part of me that goes, oh, they played on my emotions. Mm. But I actually think emotions are some useful data. Like they provide some useful data. And, mm. and it's, you know, like, there's, there's a reason to feel emotionally connected to a nuclear bomb blowing up and killing, you know, a ton of people. Mm. Like, there's a reason why your emotions should be involved in that conversation. And it doesn't mean that the emotions win out over the intellect when they're in conflict. But if you're not willing to feel, you won't know when your emotions are in play. If you're mm. not willing to use it as data, you don't know when you're at risk of allowing emotions to overplay the intellect. So my suggestion is you don't do everything your emotions tell you to do, but if you really wanna be academic, if you really wanna be logical and rational and make sure that data is driving things, you better know what you're feeling and why and where you're feeling it so that you can make discrete discerning choices based on all of the data that you have. And if you notice that you're feeling a certain way, but the data tells you something different, look at that and Mm. say, what's going on here? And maybe it's like something to notice, which is to say, I don't feel good about this. And yet, so I'm going to double check the data, but now I've double checked the data and I know that this is what the data is saying. So, you know, something else is in play, confirmation bias or whatever it is that's kind of in play. You understand what it is and you understand what's going on. And by understanding it, you can be much more thoughtful and intentional and strategic and discerning than Mm. if you don't know what's going on and you're just feeling stuff messily. I really like that. Emotions are data. Great quote. And I think, um, I think you're right that it allows you to make better decisions if it becomes more of a question of self-awareness and self-control rather than good or bad, right? Right. Logic versus emotion, et cetera. You, if you are, you can rise above and be self-aware of both. You can look at both and analyze both of them and, and make evaluations and be more discerning, like you said. Excellent, Absolutely. excellent stuff. Um, I do want to get to the, these key elements. So the, 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 was it the three critical elements of- Yeah, there's, so there's four critical elements. Emotional four. courage is one. So there's yes. three other ones. And okay. it's confidence in yourself, connection to others, commitment to purpose. Mm. And if you think about it, big picture, it's what's going on here, yes. what's going on here, and what's going on here. Right. So am I grounded? Am I confident? Confidence is not arrogance. Arrogance is I think I'm better than everybody else. And arrogance is born of insecurity. 
Mm. So when I'm arrogant, it's actually because I'm not feeling confident, actually. Mm. So the people who think they're better than everybody else, who consistently walk in feeling like they're the smartest guy in the room or the smartest woman in the room and they know everything, they're not confident, actually. Mm. Confidence, and this is really important for academics, confidence is the willingness to say, I don't know something. Yes. It's the willingness to be curious. All of, all of great academia, all great academic learning and teaching is based on curiosity, mm. right? You can't be curious without also being confident because curiosity is about the unknown. Yes. And, you know, academics, I'm going to put myself in this world of academic. You know, I write for Harvard Business Review and I, yeah. I you know, I'm, I do a lot of this kind of writing. I'm not an academic in, in the full sense, but I would say you know, academics have a hard time not knowing. Like mm. it's all about knowing. It's all about creating certainty out of uncertainty. And that's what research is about. That's what data is about. And, and that means that it requires a tremendous amount of confidence to not know. But you can't learn anything without starting from a place of not knowing. Otherwise, there's no room, right? I mean, if you know everything, then what are you going to learn? I remember right. seeing a bumper sticker that said, hire a teenager while he still knows everything. And, <laughs> and I, you know, but, you know, you know, if you know everything, then there's no space for learning. So that's yeah. confidence. Confidence is, you know, a lot of stuff could be going on. Confidence is, I really thought I'd come out. I had a hypothesis and I thought the data would show me something and it doesn't. It shows me the opposite. And I'm willing to learn from that and look at it and see what it's mm. showing me, right? And that's really powerful as an academic. So connection to others is what's going on between us. And can I build trustworthy relationships? And can I trust you and be trusted by you? Can I see you and appreciate you and be seen and appreciated by you? You mm. cannot lead without confidence and connection, right? And there are people who are strong in one and not strong in the other. So I could be super confident and not very connected in which case, it's still all about me. Even if I'm willing to not know, even if I'm, it's still all about me and I don't care what's going on for you. Conversely, I could be super connected to you, but not particularly confident. And then I lose myself. And we all know people who will give themselves up to please the people around them. Mm. And by the way, those people can actually be pretty successful in organizations early on, but they can't rise to higher senior levels. And they usually burn out before that's an issue anyway. Mm. So it's, you know, it's, it's actually... Being, staying connected. And here's a great test of it, especially as an academic. Go in with an opinion, and I know everyone here has opinions. <laughs> Go in with an opinion and have a conversation with someone with the opposite opinion. And this could be anything. It could be politics. It could be, you know, your area of expertise. It could be anything. Go in there and, and have a conversation with them where your opinion isn't threatened by their opposite opinion yes. and you both leave feeling respected and seen and appreciated right so i don't have to change my perspective because it's different than yours but i also don't have to change your perspective because it makes me uncomfortable that it's different than mine and the ability to for us to really be able to hold both of those and hold the relationship at the same time is critical in terms of powerful leadership so that's confidence and connection and commitment to purpose is all that's fine that I've talked about so far in terms of being in a relationship, but what are we doing with that relationship? Are we moving forward in some way in something that's important? And commitment to purpose is what is this bigger thing that we're all going to align behind? Mm. And this is something we do a lot of work in organizations, helping them to create collaborative, coherent, productive movement in a particular direction. It's also about making choices, about what you say no to in order to say yes to other things. And that's really hard. Commitment to purpose is about distinguishing signal from noise. It's about focusing on what's most important, right? I could be super committed in, in my area of study and to purpose, and I could think that I'm really committed. But if it's 15 years and I haven't written my dissertation yet, then the answer is, I'm not very good at distinguishing signal from noise that I'm not saying like, this is important. And that other thing is going to be less important so that I can prioritize that. And then finally, emotional courage, which we've talked about the willingness to feel you cannot, you cannot make moves to develop your confidence in yourself, your connection to others and your commitment to purpose without also developing and leveraging your, your emotional courage, your willingness to feel things because anytime you build that, you're going to feel stuff. And by the way, 
this is not like a personality assessment where it's okay to be strong in some things and weak in others. You really want to, if you're going to be an effective leader, you need to be strong in all four of these things. And as you pointed out before, there's an assessment on our website. It's free. You can take it. Yes. And it kind of gives you a sense. And each question in the assessment relates to a chapter in the book. So, so you, it's actually diagnostic as, as well as analytical that you can kind of look at it and go, oh, you know, I need help in 17 and 23. And you can literally look at those chapters and begin to build some of that capability. Fantastic. And we'll put that link in the uh, chat box here and I'll show it at the end. I just have one more question for you because I think it's very relevant to our audience who many of them, they're going into maybe their first phone screen ever, their first interview, their first really difficult conversation where there's a lot on the line um, after maybe years, even a decade of mostly working by themselves and having pretty general discussions in academia. So how do you have a difficult conversation? And maybe it is in academia. Maybe it's a difficult conversation you have to have with your PI or advisor to finally let you graduate or to, you know, get a pay raise because you're a postdoc, whatever it is. Right. How, where do you start? How do you have that conversation? So the first place to start is start with lead with the punchline. You should always lead with the punchline. I can't tell you how many conversations I've been. I had a friend who was telling me about a conversation and, and he was in this conversation and it was 15 minutes in and he finally said to the person, <laughs> ah, I'm, I'm really listening and I, I just can't tell if you're promoting me or firing me. And it's because, you know, they were, they were giving backstory and like, you're really good at this, but then you're challenged there and, but you know, and, and they weren't coming out and saying it. So if you have a hard conversation, lead with the punchline, start with the very first thing. That's the hardest thing that's stressing you out, say it, and then mm -hmm. back it up with data, back it up with information, back it up with rationale and backstory. Don't take 30 minutes to build the backstory. Right. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's something that academics get, get <laughs> slammed for all the time. It's yeah. like, the, you know, use what you know really to, to underscore what you're trying to, the point that you're trying to make rather than undermine it. Mm. And if you want to underscore it, then make the point that you're making and then offer the amount of backup that's needed in order to, uh, in order to follow it up versus give a ton of backup in order to sort of build the story that drives your conclusion that you're going to lose most people and they're going to drop. If they could literally drop off, they would be dropping off. So that's one thing. The other thing I just want to say in terms of the various scenarios that you offered is do a lot of listening. Even when you have a point to make, be willing to listen to what's going on. If you want to influence someone, listening to them is actually the strongest way to influence them. Mm. Yeah. And it's counterintuitive. I, I just, again, this was an incredible <laughs> interview and very aligned with what we talk about. Again, as academics, like Peter said, you're used to giving a presentation where you show like the least most important data first, gradually build to the most important data, then make a conclusion an hour later when everybody's asleep, lead with that punchline, especially in an interview, whether it's about yourself, whatever. I think that's fantastic. Right. So. Please thank Peter for his time here. We really appreciate it. I know you have a lot of other things going on. Um, I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to go to the, all the great things that you have online. I'm going to show my screen here very quickly. Go to this assessment. It's at uh, Bregman. I want to make sure I'm saying that right. Bregman? Bregman, yep. Bregman, Bregman Partners. Bregmanpartners.com. Where is your leadership gap assessment? Take this assessment Go connect with him on LinkedIn as well and go look at his book. I think we have it. I think we have it. Resources. Yeah, let me show this link here. All of his books are on this page and they're all incredible. As you can tell, he's an incredible communicator. His writing is superb. Go check out his books. I recommend start with Leading with Emotional Courage, but check out 18 Minutes and Four Seconds. Great books. Peter, thank you for your time. Such a pleasure. Thank you. And I want to know who your interior decorator is because I love the background of this whole thing. It's <laughs> Thank uh, you're, 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 uh, it, lots of great color. I'm looking at mine and I, you know, I've got a nice painting, but I'm pretty much just like white <laughs> and beige and you're, you're, you put me to shame. So I have the same mic as you, but. You know, oh, nice. All right. I kind of cool. want the, uh, the red. I kind of want the color. The roulette red was a mistake, but uh, that's another story. It so. looks great. I think it that's looks great. Right. It's a mistake that works. Sometimes mistakes work. It's true. Thanks, Peter. Thanks so much. You. Pleasure thank you. To be with you. Please thank Peter. And again, go check out his books. Really grateful to have him on. And we're going to jump right to Brian Getson. I'm going to go over Brian's bio here. Uh, very, very, we are very, very lucky to have Brian on. This is Brian. Uh, he has extensive experience in preparing EB1A, EB1B, and national interest waiver petitions for scientific researchers throughout the U.S. 
graduated cum laude at Duke University, attended the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and he specifically works with STEM PhDs, helping them get visas and green cards, which is a visa too. Um, he is uh, involved with the world's most prestigious scientific organizations, including the American Society of Cell Biology, Materials Research Society, American Chemical Society, Association for Research and Vis Vision, um, and many others, including the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. I'm going to show his firm's website, Getson and Schatz. They are the world's number one immigration firm for helping STEM PhDs get into uh, U.S. jobs, helping with the visa process, the green card process. Uh, you can see even their URL is Researcher Green Card. Uh, so you can just go to Researcher Green Card to learn more about them. They are a very close, very close partners of ours, specifically with our international PhD community program. Very lucky to have Brian on with us today. Hi, Brian. Hi, uh, good afternoon, Isaiah. How are you? Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for uh, coming on. Good to see you. Are you yeah. home for the holidays already? I'm working from home today and then back to the office tomorrow and Friday, and then it's uh, time for some R&R. &R. Great. Good to hear. And I uh, appreciate you being on with us. Uh, I know we have a whole list of questions here. A lot of questions were sent in to us, so we want to get through them all for all of you uh, PhDs who are working to get hired before the end of the year even. Uh, the first question is, what is the most common way for foreign nationals to apply for a green card based on employment? Sure. So most foreign nationals who are working in the U.S. that are not conducting scientific research, they have to go through what's called the PERM labor certification process. And that involves having an employer sponsor you for the green card. You can't file on your own. And the employer has to conduct recruitment that is mandated by the Labor Department, such as putting ads in Sunday newspapers and conducting other recruitment online in order to show a lack of U.S. worker availability. So for, you know, jobs that do not involve scientific research, that's generally the only option available to obtain a green card. Yeah, and that brings me to the second question here, and this is something I haven't heard of before, the PERM labor certification process. So what can PhDs do to avoid this and get a green card based on their research accomplishments? Sure. So, you know, the theme of today is leadership, Isaiah. Right. So, you know, and that lends itself to being a leader in your research field. So if you have made scientific accomplishments that have impacted or influenced your field, then you can look to avoid this labor certification process and apply for a green card based on your own research accomplishments. So everybody listening today should be looking to do that. And there's three different types of categories where you can obtain a green card based on your research accomplishments. There's the EB1A category, and that is called Extraordinary Ability Aliens. There is the EB1B category, and that is called Outstanding Professors and Researchers. And there is the EB2 National Interest Waiver category. And what I mean by EB1 and EB2 is there's different classifications of green cards that is uh, set forth by Congress. And there's something called the Visa Bulletin that is issued by the Department of State each month. And if you would just Google Visa Bulletin, you would see it and you would see these different categories. With EB1A, and EB1B, there is a wait to apply for a green card for the entire world, mm. as well as China and India. So when I say the entire world, that means everybody other than China and India. And that's for EB1A and EB1B. For the national interest waiver category, there is a wait for China and India, but not for the rest of the world. So, and this is a relatively new phenomenon, Isaiah. It yeah. started for the first time ever in my entire career this past October, and it looks like it's going to remain that way. So yes. the advice now is if you're not from China or India, you really should only be thinking about applying in the NIW category because it's easier than the EB1 categories and you don't have to wait. There were times in the past where people not from China and India for various reasons could get the green card faster in the EB1 category, but it's not the case anymore. And if so, if you are from China or India, you still want to look to the EB1 category, but those are hard. 
Right. And, and, you know, this is something we talk a lot about again in the international PhD community, but making the correct choice is important and being, you know, having the, the support of a, a legal team of people who've been through the process is crucial. So I want to move forward to the next question. Uh, can PhDs currently legally, uh, who are legally present in the U.S., can they apply for a green card from within the U.S. regardless of their status? Sure. So this is a big misconception that we hear from the scientific community, Isaiah. You can apply for a green card no matter what status you're in. So regardless of your non-immigrant status, whether you're in F1, whether you're in H1B, whether you're in TN, which is for Canadians and Mexicans, whether you're in J1 or O1A, those are all of the possible classifications that you can be in. You're allowed to apply for the green card no matter where you are. Now, you might not want to, right. and, you, you, you know, you might want to wait until you're in a different classification or wait for your credentials to grow stronger. And also, H-1B is the only category that's known as a dual intent visa category. And what that means is applying for the 485 green card application does not prevent you from holding H-1B status, from extending it, from traveling. So H-1B is the best classification to apply for a green card out of, but mm. you can apply for it out of anything. And when we talk about applying for a green card, it's two parts. There's the I-140 petition, which is the EB-1A, EB-1B, and NIW, and then there's the I-45 green card application. Yes. So. You know, if you're from China or India, you can only file the I-140 petition at first because there's a waiting list for you to file the I-485. Additionally, if you're not in H-1B status, it's probably not a good idea to file the I-485 green card until you have an approved I-140, you know, the, the NIW, because that's really what this is going to be applicable to. Because, again, you're waiting if you're from China or India. So... That's a huge mistake that I see you know, researchers make with it, you know, who either don't get good legal advice or they, you know, try and do it on their own is if you file the 485 while you're in a non-immigrant status like F1 or J1, now you can't extend that status. And if something goes wrong with your application and it gets denied, it could create problems for you. So, you know, there's, there's really two parts to, dealing with researchers. There's your credentials, and then there's the strategy of maintaining your underlying non-immigrant status and when is the best time to file. And you can't neglect one or the other because yes. they're both equally important in the decision in terms of you know, how you go about filing for a green card. Yeah, uh, just again, great information. If you haven't thanked Brian yet, please thank him. I wanna ask about a couple of the types of visas you brought up, F1 OPT, TN1, uh, H1B in just a second, but there was a good question here um, from Mariam said, how long would it take to get a green card with an NIW for uh, non-Indians and non-Chinese? Sure. So if you're in H1B status and, you know, I feel that you're, you're qualified for the green card where I'm going to offer you our money back guarantee, where if the case doesn't get approved, we're going to refund you our attorney's fee. Mm. then I would suggest that you would file the I-485 and the I-140 together. File them at the same time. And the average processing time for the I-140 is five to nine months. It, you know, it's a little bit faster processing right now at the Nebraska Service Center than the Texas Service Center, but the, the average is five to nine months. So if you're in H-1B status and you're filing both together, or if you're filing both together out of another status because you're forced to, then mm. after you have the I-140 petition approved, your green card interview is going to be scheduled probably within a month or two after because you've already filed them both together. If you're filing out of F-1 status or J-1 or O-1, and we say just file the I-140 first and then wait to file the I-485, or even if you're just filing separately out of H-1B, then you're looking at the five to nine month window. And after that, you have to file the 485 green card and it could be anywhere from another seven to 10 months to get the green card. So you're gonna save time if you file them together, but sometimes you have to be risk-free 
and mm. file them separately. I always like to be risk-free, Isaiah, unless yeah. you have to take the risk because of your certain situation. You know, you can't put yourself in a situation where if your green card gets denied, you're going to have no underlying non-immigrant okay. status. You never want to leave yourself where you could be illegal in the U.S. So that's the time frame. And then it's about a four-month preparation time frame, Isaiah. You know, when somebody hires us, from the time we start until we file, it's about four months. It can be sooner than that. It can be a little longer if there's delays because people, yes. you know, take long to get back to me or getting the letter signed. But that's the average preparation time in terms of writing all of the reference letters, which are the most important part of a green card petition. Perfect. And I want to kind of rapid fire go through these just for awareness because the definitions I think get misconstrued very often among the PhD community. Um, so the, what is, first of all, what is the F1 OPT period? Sure. So after you graduate from your PhD in the United States, you're allowed open market work authorization and it's the OPT. And there are certain windows within which you can apply for that. And you need to work with your school official. You cannot miss that window. You can't apply too early and you can't apply too late or you're, they're not going to approve it. So you want to work with your school official to make sure you apply for that EAD at the appropriate time. Once you get the EAD, you can work anywhere you want that's related to your PhD program. You can't go work at Walmart, but you can work you know, in an industry job or an academia job that is related to your PhD program. So you get an initial 12 months of OPT, and then you're allowed a 24 month STEM extension. And in order to get that STEM extension, your employer has to be an E-Verify employer, meaning they do their I-9 forms electronically with the government. Nearly every employer that you know, the cheeky scientist members are going to work for is an E-Verify employer. Strange enough, there's a few universities that are not. Mm -hmm. So when you're applying for your job in your OPT, you want to make sure that your employer is an E-Verify employer when you're interviewing so that you know you're going to be able to keep working there for your 24-month STEM extension. I hear a lot of rumors that Trump is taking away the 24-month STEM extension. He's not, okay, that's just not going to happen, so don't worry about that. And, you know, we always talk, Isaiah, about planning ahead. So when you get, when you're applying for your OPG job, if you're going to industry, you wanna make sure that the employer is gonna sponsor you for the H-1B visa in the lottery. I, you know, I would not suggest taking a job if the, in industry if the employer is not gonna sponsor you for H-1B. If you're in academia, then are they going to sponsor you for H-1B when it's done, or are you going to have to go into J-1? So you always, as a, you know, an F-1 student, you want to be thinking ahead to your next step. So we're talking about strategy of your plan moving forward to maintain your lawful status and ability to work. And at the same time, you want to be building your credentials towards a green card. So that is the F-1, Isaiah. Perfect. And just, just for clarity, because I know sometimes we can take it literally, we, had, we recently had an associate transition into a user experience analyst position at Home Depot. So if it's, it's a PhD level job, it's okay, even if it's Walmart. <laughs> it's just, you can't be a non-PhD. Correct. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, the, the next question is, can you tell us just quickly the difference between H1B, TN, and J1 and O1A, and you can mix and match those as ever, however sure. you want. So, you know, again, after your OPT, you need to go somewhere. You have to have a plan to have some status. You're either going to have the green card if you, if you apply for your NIW during your OPT. Again, you can't do that now anymore for China, and India, and the EB1 because of the backlog. But you might have your green card if you're qualified enough by the end of your OPT. If not, where are you going to go? So the first category where you could possibly go is H-1B. And as I was mentioning, there's a difference between industry and academia. Academia is what's called cap exempt. So you can be sponsored for an H-1B by academia at any time during the year without limitation. Academia likes to put PhD postdocs into J-1 and not H-1B because they can pay you less in J-1 than H-1B. 
but you want to push for the H-1B because it's better for you because of that non-immigrant uh, uh, dual intent that I was talking about before. Mm -hmm. So if you're in academia, you're pretty comfortable about being able to, to have status after the end of your H1, uh, LPT, because you're either going to have a cap exempt H1B or you're going to have J1, which is a, a, a postdoc, you know, scholar job. Mm -hmm. You want to also try and avoid J1 because there's something called a two year home residency requirement where most postdocs are subject to that, especially those from China and India. And that means you can't get an H-1B or a green card without waiving it. If you have to take the J-1 in academia versus nothing at all, then you take the J-1 and you deal with the two-year requirement down the line. If you're in industry, then you have to go into the H-1B lottery. And that is run the first five business days of April every year to start in October. There's 85,000 total H-1B visas. 65,000 for those with U.S. masters and higher, and 20,000 others. And you need to have your employer apply for H-1B in your first year of your OPT, in your second year of your OPT, and in your third. And it, just in case you don't win the lottery in the first or the second, then you're going to have three bites at the apple. So even if it means cutting your OPT short, from a strategy standpoint, you have to do that. Mm you know, once you're in your OPT. And they're talking about changing the lottery rules, Isaiah, which is going to benefit PhDs to some extent. What they're saying is right now, normally, we submit our petition to immigration. We have to submit the complete package. And they take it, and then they run the lottery. And then if your case doesn't win the lottery, your entire package gets sent back. And also, the way they do it right now is they run the lottery by selecting the 65,000 first and then selecting the 25, uh, sorry, they select the 20,000 U.S. masters first and then they select the 65,000. Yes. They're talking about doing two things differently. Number one is pre-registering electronically and then they're going to run the lottery and if you win, then you send your package in. So that would save them a lot of mailing expense and sorting through huge stacks of paper. That's why they want to do that. And then they're thinking about running the lottery in reverse, running the 65,000 first and then the 20,000. And they think that's going to give people with U.S. master's degrees or higher about an 8% greater chance of winning because you're going to go into the whole big pool first and then you're going to have your separate pool. So, you know, that's, but the point is that if you're in industry, you need to run yourself in the lottery. If you're from Canada or Mexico, there's something called a TN visa. And that would really be used as an alternative in industry to the H-1B. You could also use it in the university. I'd rather you be in H-1B than TN. But if you're going to, the choice is between TN and J-1, then you want to take the TN. And, you know, basically any job that anybody listening right now would take would qualify for TN if you're a Canadian citizen or a Mexican citizen. You can apply for the green card out of TN status. We would normally want to just file the I-140. And there's actually a letter from the Immigration Service saying that if you've just filed the I-140, you can still freely enter the United States in TN status. If you file the 485, you can't. So that's another misconception that people have about TNs. And that's where we bifurcate the I-140 petition and the I-485. And it's perfectly fine to apply for a green card out of TN status. Perfect. And then the last category is O-1A, Isaiah. And this is an alternative if you're in industry and you don't win the H-1B lottery. You know, I've had clients, again, three years in a row, they don't win the lottery. So, or their company doesn't file for them the first two years, and then the third year, they don't win it. So O-1A is the non-immigrant equivalent of EB-1A. It's showing you're among the small percentage of researchers at the very top of the field in the world. And O-1A is a very useful tool for people that are working in industry, whether you're from China, India, or anywhere, to work for an employer. Also, you don't have to wait. 
So if you're not an OPT, and let's say you're outside the United States, then you could apply for O1A in order to start working for an industry employer without needing to worry about this April and October timing. If you're at the end of your six years of H1, going to O1A is also a useful tool. And the third time O1A is used is if you're subject to the J1 two-year residency requirement, you can still hold O1A status. So these are all of the different non-immigrant statuses, Isaiah. I, I wanted to just kind of go back to the basics today yes. to you know, just talk about here's your non-immigrant status and here's the different green card categories that you can apply for. Perfect. Thank you, Brian, for your time. We, we went a bit over, but I wanted to make sure that he had uh, a chance to talk about the, the basics there. I know a lot of you had questions. You have more questions here. We'll address them in the group, and hopefully we'll see some of you in the international PhD community. Please thank Brian for his time, and please go over to his website. Very easy to remember, researchergreencard.com. He's helped a lot of associates get their visas. I'm going to show it here on the screen. Very easy to contact, too. I, I, I love when I see a, a firm of this size doing things right online. <laughs> Phone number right at the top, email right at the top, a button right here where you can click with one click and, and get access to their, their information and, and they'll get in touch with you. Brian's again helped a lot of PhDs, uh, a lot of researchers specifically get into the US. So thank you, Brian, for your time. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you, Isaiah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so this takes us to the end of the public portion of the radio show. We covered a lot of ground today. We talked about leadership. We heard from a best-selling author on what you need to do in terms of uh, communicating your transferable skills, specifically your leadership skills and your core competencies. If you're watching us live, you're not an associate yet, you want to learn more about the association, what is it? Just go to phdsgethired.com, phdsgethired.com. Thank you all for joining us for another Cheeky Scientist radio show. We look forward to seeing you on a future show very, very soon. This takes us to the end of another Cheeky Scientist radio show podcast. Thank you for joining us. If you want to learn more about transitioning into your first or next job in industry, just go to phdsgethired.com. Go to phdsgethired.com. We will send you all of our free training materials that will help you start your job search now or help you take it to the next level in business. As always, remember your value as a PhD and start thinking and acting like a successful industry professional. Pump up the